Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm Roger Edrington. If you're new today, we're so pleased that you're here and a part of this community. I'm the interim pastor, sort of on the downswing of that interim today. So, uh, but that's a great affirmation, that song of what we believe. If you're new to faith, you're not sure what you believe, then those sort of words help us to say, what is this truth? And if you have questions about that, it's always good to ask and say, well, why do you believe that? And hopefully many of us here can help you uh, along in that journey. Now, sometimes we have so many things in our mind that we forget about the one thing that really matters. Now, I'm sure many of you have done what I've done. I go into a room for one thing, and then I see, you already know, a whole bunch of other things that I need to do, and then I go back out and I forget that one thing that I was there to get. Sometimes it seems like we remember the the least important details of life, but we forget the one thing that's most important. What's the one thing that you want to accomplish in life? What's the one thing you want to hold on to, even if everything else goes away? What do you want to hang on to no matter if you lose everything else? What's the primary goal toward which your life is headed? I want to follow along from Ephesians chapter 3, beginning with with verse 10 today. We'll kind of stay in that passage most of the day today, though I'll throw in a couple other passages too. So Philippians, did I say Ephesians? It's Philippians. Look at what you read, not what I say, okay? Philippians 3, chapter 10. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection of the dead. Paul wants to know Christ. Does he not know him already? You know, we speak of our relationship with Christ as knowing him personally. But Paul wants to know Christ? Has he missed something along the line? When Paul first met Jesus on the road to Damascus and he was struck by a blinding light, he asked that question, Who are you, Lord? He didn't know Christ then. He didn't recognize Jesus. He was headed in the wrong direction. He was doing the opposite of what he should be doing, even though he thought he was serving God. And yet in that blinding light encounter, Jesus met Paul. And later, Ananias introduced Paul to who Jesus really was. And Paul began to get to know Jesus in a personal way rather than the remote way that he'd always known God, just from the law. But now many years after that blinding light when Paul writes, Paul wants to know Christ in an even deeper way. He's a great apostle by now. He's spreading the good news around the world, but he knows that he's not arrived. He wants to know the power of Jesus' resurrection. Now he, like all believers, has met Jesus in his death and resurrection through his baptismal experience. He writes in Romans chapter 6, We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we've been united with him like this in his death, we shall certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. He's experienced one aspect of the resurrection, but he hasn't yet experienced the full power of the resurrection. So he looks forward to that day. He doesn't know how it all works. He says he wants to somehow attain to the resurrection from the dead. He hasn't died yet, but he looks forward to being resurrected as Jesus was. And he says that he wants to share the sufferings of Christ. He wants to join that fellowship of Christ's sufferings. Now, probably not many of us want to join that group. Uh, Hey, I'd like you to join the Men's Fellowship of Suffering. Would you like to come? We meet every Friday night. Or we have a great women's ministry here. It's called SCS, Sharing Christ's Sufferings. Probably wouldn't get many coming. But Paul's not afraid 
because he knows that resurrection will follow his death. He's looking forward to it, knowing that he's not there yet. And he hasn't attained even what he wants to here on earth yet. He wants to know the fullness of Christ, everything that God has for him. Paul continues, and this is the part we really want to stress today in chapter uh, 3, verse 12. Not that I've already obtained this, or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus has taken hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I, I don't want you to consider myself to have not yet taken hold. But one thing I do, one thing I do, forgetting, I forget what's behind and strain forward to what's ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. And as we begin a new season of life here at Blossom Valley Bible Church, I think Paul wants to remind us of this one thing to do. If you don't do anything else, he says, do this. And I think this will help us in our church's renewed journey of faith. Let me get specific. The first point I want to make is forget the past glory days. Forget the past glory days. Paul had to forget his past glory days. He had a terrific genetic heritage. He had a stellar education with the best teachers. He'd done all the right things. He jumped through all the correct hoops. He was successful and powerful, and he was an up-and-coming Jewish leader, a major leader. He, w- he was squashing a heresy that they he saw as a false religion, a cult, this cult of Christianity that was a major threat to, to his people. But here's what he writes, if we back up just a little bit in Philippians 3, verse 4. If anyone thinks that he has reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, that's the right day, of the people of Israel, the chosen people, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. I'm a real man's man. I'm a real Hebrew. I'm a real person of God. In regard to the law, I'm a Pharisee. You don't get any gooder than these people. As for zeal, he was serious about it. He was persecuting the church. And as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. Then what he says, but whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What's more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I've lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God and is by faith, by trusting. Even those strong religious accomplishments, which could be considered success by any man's reckoning, Paul realized these were just a distraction that he needed to let go of. They needed to be tossed away. His advantages had actually become disadvantages because he viewed them as the way of being made right with God. And our own accomplishments our own successes, whether in work or family or church, do not add up to points on the scoreboard so that God will recognize that we are worthy of spending eternity with him. No, no, Paul says, they may be trash that has to be thrown away because they have become hindrances. They keep us relying on something that has little value in the kingdom. A few years ago, when I, when I think I was speaking about this passage, it may have been another one, but I, but I held up a Sunday school of attendance pin that I had. I was awarded for perfect attendance in Sunday school. Maybe some of you earned those as well. It's been a while since those have been out. Mine was long. I had 21 years straight when I was 23, when I stopped counting. I never missed a Sunday of attending Sunday school since I was two years old. Maybe having a doctor for a dad was an advantage, I don't know. 
But I think my big advantage was having parents who always took me to church. Neither rain nor sleet nor snow was going to take us away. And that Sunday, I'd placed a trash can by the pulpit, and I threw that pin away as trash. Like Paul, my religious heritage was an advantage. As some of you who don't have that advantage of being raised up in the church wish that you did have it sometimes. But if we view those advantages as accomplishments for earning a way of being right with God, they have to be regarded as rubbish so that we can gain Christ. Those achievements, those advantages, because of your family or your friends or your background, often have to be regarded as rubbish so that you can really gain Christ. Some of us have great advantages. And it's catapulted us to accomplish great things in our lives. And some of us have great disadvantages because of our family or our background. And yet we've overcome them or are in the process of overcoming them. But some of us may be hanging on to our accomplishments. Whether they're religious or family uh, or, family or secular some advantages you've had, and you may think that those make you right with God. They don't. The only righteousness of value is being made right with God through putting your trust in Jesus Christ. And we're grateful all we have benefited from, but we realize that those things don't make us right with God. Only the grace of God does. Now, as I get older, I get more nostalgic. I don't know about you, some of you who are in my category. I want to look back at the past. I want to look at the good old days. I want to remember those happy college days when my life turned around and I began to see Jesus and truth a whole lot deeper. I want to remember those great days when I ministered in England, when those, when my youthful enthusiasm helped me walk into places where angels feared to tread. And tell people about the gospel. We're taking the courage to knock on doors, not knowing who would answer them, encountering things that I'd never experienced before. Those were powerful. Those were learning. Those were growing days when I was stretched out full to try to figure out how life worked in that new culture for me. And we here may be tempted to look back at the good old glory days when our church was 500, 600 strong, when everything was going well, when you liked everything, when the preaching was solid, when the music was your style, when the people looked like you looked like. But one thing I do, forgetting what's behind. Those days are gone. It's a new day. It's a new world. People aren't as interested in Christianity as they used to be, and yet Jesus Christ is just as amazing and just as needed as ever to those people who don't know. And there are plenty of people out there today who might be interested if we would just give them the opportunity. If we would just take the opportunity to share with them a little bit of truth or a little bit of our life. But we may not be able to reach them in the same way that we used to. We have to go on their turf. We have to listen to their stories. We have to walk with them through their journey and lead them to follow Jesus. And although this probably wasn't Paul's point, here's another thing we need to do. We need to forget the disastrous days in this church when it was hard for many of you to even want to come to church. If you don't feel like uh, writing down disastrous, you can write in difficult. But I've heard some of the stories, and I didn't live them with you, but I know that they were very, very painful. And many of you were hurt, and many of our friends left the church, and many of you also had your walking boots on and were ready for the exit door as well. The hurts were real. The deception was serious. The words spoken cut cut your heart like a knife. The finances became disastrous. The church became dysfunctional. But those days are behind us, right? They're past. They're part of our history. But God is remaking history with his story. 
This new story, his new story is taking us to a new place, a new time with new leadership and new followers of Jesus yet to be found. So I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong here, but I think it's time to forget the hurts. Leave behind the pains. Dismiss the deception and put aside the misrepresentation. And forgive anything that still may be lingering. Now, of course, you won't totally forget. Well, some of us will because we can't remember very much anymore. (laughs) But we have to forget in the sense of stop letting it affect us. We don't want to live in reaction to the past. We want to be completely free from it. It's part of our history, but it's behind us, and we're ready to leave it. It doesn't have any power to follow us anymore. It's a new day. But one thing I do, forgetting what's behind. Isaiah writes a similar word of hope to Israel. But first he says, forget about what's happened. Don't keep going on over old history. Be alert. Be present. I'm about to do something brand new. It's bursting out. Do you see it? There it is. I'm making a road through the desert, rivers in the badlands. We've been in the badlands before, but we're not there anymore. We're in a new place. And some of you have some badlands in your life, too. You have some things, some hurts, some destruction, some bad choices, some sins. And you need to forget about those two because God has forgiven them and he is moving us on. So thirdly, move forward to a new day. Move forward to a new day. It's time to take the healing and stability we've shared and use it to move forward. To move forward to become more of what God's called us to be as a church. To take new steps of faith so that new people can take their first steps of faith. And it's perhaps a new day to move forward in your own relationship with Christ. Are there habits you need to leave behind? Are there new patterns you need to develop? Are there sins which you need to say to so long? Are there genuine hurts, substantial regrets, and terrible reminders that you need to bid adieu? I know it's not always easy, but Christ has called you to a new life. He's called you to a life of love and freedom and joy. Paul writes in verse 14, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. It's time to press on toward the goal, to press on. It's time to press on toward that goal to win the prize for which God has called you. Paul knew that he hadn't obtained it all. He was probably in prison when he wrote this, hampered by chains and bars. His obstacles were huge, but he knew the goal. And he was pressing toward it, and nothing was going to hold him back. He wasn't giving up. I might have been tempted to give up if I'd been in his situation. I think I would have. But Paul wasn't going to do it. Now let me speak to those of you, those of us, who are older for a minute. We still have much to accomplish. We have not arrived at our destination. We haven't received the prize yet. We haven't been called heavenward yet. We press on. We continue. We have a calling. We have a purpose. Something significant to contribute to God's kingdom while we are still on earth. Now some of us may have physical or other problems that may hold us back from what we'd like to do or what we used to do. And I don't minimize those limitations at all. They're real. And some of us are caregivers. And you've been giving a lot. And it's not easy. It feels overwhelming at time, and perhaps you even feel, you know, confined. But even though you didn't choose that mission, that's what you're called to do. But we're not washed up. Even if we're retired from our our main work, we're not has-beens, as I've sometimes jokingly called myself. 
You're still a follower of Jesus who can give what you have to others. You never retire from being a follower of Jesus. And what is more, and it's more than just showing up for Bible study and church as well, it's taking what little you have and giving it to others. It's taking your five loaves and two fish and giving it to Jesus to see what he will do with it. It's putting your last two copper coins in the offering to help someone else. It's searching for the pearl of great price and that treasure that's hidden in the field. It's seeking the lost sheep who lives next door to you so that she can find protection and care and love in the arms of the good shepherd. And one of the things you who are ministering regularly can do is train other people to do the job that you've been doing. You won't be here forever. You can take the time to teach a younger person the importance of what you're doing now. They need you. They can, they can, and, and you can draw somebody else into your circle. And, and show how Jesus has changed your life. You can tell your story of successes and failures of following the Lord. You can tell, that you, uh, tell them that you are looking forward to a new day when you can watch them fulfill their purpose, them fulfill their ministry, not just in the church, but in that challenging world outside as well. Fifthly, it's time to take hold. It's time to take hold. Paul says in verse 11, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Do you remember when Christ first took hold of you? He captured your heart with new love. He captured your mind with new truths. He seized your soul with a sense of, of value and direction. He enlivened your spirit in a way that you didn't even think was possible. He took hold of you for a promise. You have a purpose. Whether you're 41 or 101, whether you're 23 or 83, God took hold of you not just to save you from something, but to save you for something. He took hold of you for a purpose to let his will, his truth be revealed in the world. And you who are young, you may have many years to fulfill your purpose. Don't waste your younger years waiting for something to happen. Serve now. Serve your family. Serve your church. Serve your colleagues at work or at school, wherever you are. Stand up for the truth while pouring out grace to those who oppose you and disagree with you. You may not make much money now, but give out of what you make. You will do more with 90% of your money than you will with 100%. That's for sure. And those of you who are in the prime of your life, of your working life, take hold of what Christ Jesus saved you for. Use your work to glorify God. Share the gospel with that one colleague who needs it the most, but, but who thinks that they need it the least. Balance your work. Balance your life with rest and big love for others. You who have the blessings of younger children, or grandchildren, or neighbor children. Teach them how to follow Jesus. Teach them to love deeply. Teach them early so that they will love the Lord early in their lives. And spend ta time talking with them about what's important, explaining the reasons and the background for the decisions that they'll make. And as we think about our church and pressing on and taking hold, we all know that Adam is not going to solve every problem in the universe. He's good, but he's not God. And Adam doesn't want to take hold of your ministry, as he said a couple of weeks ago. He wants you to continue doing your ministries. And perhaps you will take hold of it even stronger than ever before, with clearer direction and stronger motivation and bigger love for the people that you serve. Perhaps one of the advantages of us actually becoming a smaller church than we used to be is, I suspect some of you stepped up to a ministry that you'd never done before. I, I don't know that for sure, because you were needed. There was nobody else to do it. Keep doing it, 
and draw somebody else into the process of that ministry as well. Encourage them to find a place of service if it's not serving with you. This is a new beginning for this church. When one pastor leaves and another arrives, there's an opportunity to explore new ways of looking at what God wants you to do, to make needed changes in the church, and a time to look in a fresh way of how God is going to develop a deeper walk with the Lord with you. I'm excited about what God is going to do here in new ways. Blossom Valley will be able to refocus, reevaluate, and discover what God has for this church. And the, the, the need for the Lord in this valley is huge. You know that. Press on. And I'm really pleased to be passing my portion of the baton to Adam Miller. He'll provide vision for the, and continuity for the future. He'll provide a sense of how to move forward to God's, in God's kingdom and God's way in an effective way. And I know he will love you deeply, as I have loved you in bigger ways than I thought possible in this year I've been here. You know this, but I'm going to remind you anyway. Adam won't be Tim. He won't be like the speaker you hear on your podcast. He won't be me either. And he probably won't be Billy Graham's replacement. But he will be the man God has called to be a shepherd of other shepherds in this church. Yeah. Yeah. Who in turn will shepherd other sheep and find sheep that are not yet in this fold and take them to the one and only Good Shepherd. I want to encourage you to get to know Adam and his family well. Ask Adam a significant question. He likes to go right to the heart of the issue. Tell him the story of your encounter with Jesus. Ask him what God is doing in his life. Adam will lead and pastor you well. Now, some of you have been followers of Jesus and part of this community at Blossom Valley for many years. You've seen a lot of changes. You've seen styles of music change. You've experienced many sermons, some good and some, well, not so good, including a good few of mine. You've seen trends in Sunday school and small groups come and go. You've seen different models of the church. You've seen changes that you liked and changes that you didn't like at all. You've seen pastors come and go. And by now, you know you can outlive us all. <laughs> you know that the church is not the pastor. You are the church. God has made us the church. You've stayed at Blossom Valley through ups and downs, thick and thin, and even when you disagreed, you've often been supportive and positive about God's work here. I'm especially grateful for you who've stayed through it all, who've been committed to God, who've been loyal to His church and loving His people no matter what. I brag on you everywhere I go. Your kindness and encouragement to me has been incredible. You've spoiled me so that if I go to do another interim ministry somewhere else, I'm thinking I might be disappointed. Thank you for your incredible kindness to me. And I know that you will show that same love for Adam, and Jennifer, and Caleb, Kara, and Johnny, and when those other two come back, probably them as well. In Colmar, France, you can see Matthias Grunewald's painting of the crucifixion. It's in the famous Eisenheim altarpiece. In the center of the painting, John the Baptist points at the crucified Christ. Now, this is not realism or historical accuracy, because as we know, John had lost his head long before Good Friday. But Grunewald is trying to depict a deeper truth. He's depicting John as the witness to Jesus Christ. If you notice, John's index finger is strangely elongated. 
to draw your eye to where he points. And John's finger is pointing not to himself, but to Jesus. Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He must increase and I must decrease, said John. And each of us is to be a giant finger pointing to Jesus. So we must point to Jesus all the time. And the Christ John points to is not Christ the teacher, Christ the prophet, or Christ the perfect life example, but the crucified Christ. And whatever else we might say about Jesus Christ, the one thing we must say is that he was crucified for us and he was raised to new life, that he was revealing his power within his weakness. And that's what draws us to Christ. That's what draws us to repentance and to faith in him. Christ's death does for us what we cannot do for ourselves. It frees us from sin. And to be a witness to the crucified Christ is to insist that God's grace is greater than human sin and that God's love is stronger than human hate. And that same truth remains a scandal now, just as it did in those days, because it challenges the wisdom of this age as to what constitutes real power and authority. Because in the upside-down values of the kingdom, the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. The exalted will be humbled, and the humble exalted. The poor will be filled, and the rich will be sent away empty. And in God's view, power is made perfect in weakness. And for all our accomplishments, in the end, we have nothing to offer to God but our need for Him and our trust in Him. These are not the values of business or the university today. This is not the wisdom of high tech, but it's the message of the gospel, the message that we are called to point to. And when you point someone to Jesus, you never know whose life might change forever, just like your life changed forever. I want to give a word to Adam and the elders specifically, but actually I think it applies to all of us. Paul gives his farewell words to the elders of the church in Ephesus in Acts chapter 20, verse 28. He says, keep watch over yourselves and all the flock the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds, shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, Paul says, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. My next point is keep watch. All of us keep watch, but especially you elders, you pastors, you leaders of small groups. But first, watch out for yourselves. Watch out for yourselves. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 10, so if you think you're standing firm, be careful unless you fall. And sometimes those who shepherd watch out for others, but don't watch out for themselves. And all of us must keep our spiritual connection with Jesus strong. We must keep strong in our faith, ourselves, as we serve others and share the good news. John Wesley's mother, Susanna, reminded her son, she said, this book, holding up the Bible, will either keep you from sin or sin will keep you from this book. We must all stay in the Word. And that's why we encourage daily Bible reading and prayer, as well as the other spiritual disciplines that we mentioned last week. So many leaders fall in, in, into sin because they don't keep their own personal relationship with Jesus strong and vibrant, or they fall under the weight of their own popularity. We need to watch over the sheep and watch out for wolves. Every church has danger written on it. We only have to read the words of Jesus to the same church that I was just talking about in Ephesus in Revelation 2 to know that danger would come. 
he said to them, you've forsaken your first love. Something else came in. Something held us back. And today, none of the churches that Paul established in Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey, exist today. None of them. I don't know. But perhaps it would have been different if their shepherds had been more vigilant. And there's danger today that none of the churches in the Middle East will exist in the future. Assyrians, Lebanese, Syrians, Armenians, Iraqis, and Iranians, and more Christians are threatened with extinction. These death threats come from the Islamic states, but our threats are much more subtle than that. They're from the culture in which we imbibe so deeply that we're not even aware of its corrupting influence. And our Bible leaders are shepherds over their little flocks. And those of you, some of you may have a little flock over which you're shepherd. Maybe it's only two or three people, but you're to shepherd that little flock. And sometimes our shepherds need to take it to the next level to teach them deeper discipleship. There are always dangers within that we will water down the gospel, that we will just say what people want to hear. But I have confidence in the elders, in Adam, our Bible study and ministry leaders, that they will not let this happen under their watchful eyes. But we all must always be aware of the subtleties of Satan in letting something other than the gospel of grace creep in and take over. One final word to you from Paul in another, in another passage, 1 Corinthians 15. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Sometimes it feels like it, but it's not in vain. Last point, stand firm firm. Stand firm. Don't undervalue your ministry, whatever it is. You will be tempted to wobble. Your faith can easily get spongy. It will naturally go downhill, not uphill. That's not the natural way for faith to go in our world. And sometimes we can have an honest doubt about something, about God, about a passage in the Bible, or about a Christian principle. And we start to forget about all those things we do know without a doubt. That Jesus came to earth, that he died on the cross, that he rose to new life for us, just like we sang in that song before. But we let that doubt overcome our faith. I often tell people, don't let that little part that you don't know take over the big part that you do know. Don't let it go. Those doubts are real. You, you have to deal with them. But don't let them go. Because most of us will have doubts. We'll have concerns. We'll have things we don't understand at times. But because of these doubts, don't give up on what you do know. Stand firm. The gospel is what transformed your life, not something else. Jesus is what made you strong. Forget what lies behind, but don't forget the gospel. And sometimes we start to wonder if our work, if our care for others really matters. I've wondered that many times in my life. Does what I do make a difference? Does what you do make a difference? And the time you give to help someone else is extremely valuable. A kind word, a word of truth, a challenge to someone's behavior, holding firm on principles with your children, a gift of money when somebody is struggling, just listening to something to someone who's lost something valuable in their life. Your ministry is extremely important. Your faith is priceless. Stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord. That's what I'm committed to for the rest of my life. How about you? And I know that that will be the most valuable thing you can do with your life. Hold on. Stay strong. Let nothing shake you. But this one thing I do...
forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, would you help us keep that one thing, the main thing, to keep looking forward to that truth, to that day. Help us to hold on to our calling, to not let go of it because of temptations and distractions and whatever else may call we may be called to. And Lord, we just thank you for the calling of Adam's family to this church. We pray that you will guide them and direct them to lead this church on heavenward to where you've called us. Help those of us who are discouraged at times to be encouraged by someone else's faith. Help us to lift up and know what we uh, lift you up and know what we need to know. Lord, I don't know if there's some things that somebody needs to forget here today. But I pray that they would, uh, if there is, that you would let them and help them to forget it, to leave it behind. Would you help us to press on in a way that only you can call us to do? We just thank you in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. You're all together lovely, all together.